welcome to this video on market opportunities and value assessment for the bio-based sector. For 20 years I've been passionately active in the field of new products and service marketing. And currently I'm researching the way in which small and medium-sized enterprises can improve customer insights and increase their chances to create successful value-adding innovations. My research builds upon the proven value of in-depth customer understanding in the earliest phase of innovation projects. This earliest phase is sometimes referred to as the fussy front end of innovation. However, today's state of the art tells us that front ends of successful firms are anything but fuzzy. Instead, firms rely on systematically generated customer knowledge to inspire idea generation and to assess and compare the potential value of ideas. A well-known example is LEGO, who based their new sets, such as the Apollo 5 moon rocket or the Beatles yellow submarine, on designs proposed by customers and fans. And thus LEGO saved themselves from financial collapse in 2004. Recent research by the Product Development and Management Association confirms similar systematic approaches in the front end across a wider sample. However, my research among small firms reveals that many innovators in an early phase do not consider what makes their product valuable from their customer's perspective. Instead, these firms postpone this aspect until most investments in R&D have been done. Some of the lucky firms get away with this, but this oversight quite often leads to failure and missed opportunities. A famous example of this is Iridium, who went bankrupt in 1999 after spending fast sums on developing satellite systems for mobile communication, underestimating and not responding to customer requirements for mobile communication in the process. When searching for explanations for such omissions, I found three major reasons. First, firms struggle to define the components or drivers of failure. Second, firms find it difficult to obtain access to relevant information to estimate and measure this value. And third, firms encounter complications regarding continuous correction and the management of value across the concept to development time. To help you encounter these difficulties, I will continue with an explanation of the components of value. After that, I will help you with some practical considerations for starting up your own value-generated project. But let me start out first with a brief summary of the main reasons why early value assessments are important. One way to prevent these omissions is by performing an early value assessment. There are three main reasons why early value assessments are important. First, prevent waste of resources. The Iridium case teaches us that more careful analysis and management of the value of the offering for the customers could have prevented the firm wasting their resources on a business model that was not viable. Undertaking the value assessments in the earliest stage possible could have prevented this unnecessary waste. 2. Prioritize and focus. Not wasting resources and the prevention of failure, or even like Iridium preventing bankruptcy, is of course the ultimate reason for setting up a good business case. Regarding more practical benefits, it is clear that an early business case can help you choose the most valuable market segments. There are various market segments that, you can, that can be targeted with roughly the same products. The question then becomes which one to choose. Similarly, you might need to decide your position in a value chain. For example, producers of bio-based components might choose to deliver to the regular middlemen in a certain market segment. Or, alternatively, contact the customers themselves further along the value chain. A good example is Hemcell, a 100% biodegradable plastic material supplier who choose to do business directly with some major brands to convert their packaging into biodegradable material. 3. Understand who your partner should be and get things moving. Evidence from the literature reveals that early value assessments have proven value for finding and binding the right partners and investors. By offering those partners and employees a proper insight into what the stakes are, it is easier to motivate and align everybody to a common goal and strategy. 
For this approach, it's vital to move quickly, especially in business models relying on various partners and relationships. An inspiring example is the 2018 Rabobank Sustainable Innovation Prize winner Peel Pioneers. The company excelled in putting everything in place to turn peel waste into a vi valuable resource. Now let's have a look at the three components of value. These are three sources and three terms that you need to define to make your own value equation. This exercise requires some strategic thinking, and some of you, especially the doer types, might not like this very much. But please beware that thinking beyond the right here and now might save you from major problems later. So the three types of value are each related to different beneficiaries of the value generated by entrepreneurial activity. The customers, society and the shareholders. Value to the customer can be created by offering them a superior product, superior service benefits, the lowest cost option or by giving them superior attention. These options are based on a model developed by Tracy and Wiersma in 1993 and remain valid today. There's a second, more tactical model. This is the Kano model. Kano is helpful for distinguishing the value distinct features your product might have for your customers. It comes with a specific procedure for measurement. If you are interested, you can find plenty of information on the Tracy and Wiersma and the Kano models online. Social value, the second component, is the value that other stakeholders, such as employees, governments and the general public, receive from the entrepreneurial activity. It may be related to outputs in the areas of people, planet and profit. Here you see the six sources of value related to the more traditional triple bottom line, people, planet and profit. Social value and economic value are, however, not the extremes on a one-dimensional scale. In 2011, Porter and Kramer connected the two values and redefined productivity along the wider value chain. Their thinking made clear that social harm and weaknesses create important internal costs. Wasted material, increased labour costs and thus social harm negatively impacts economic results as well. So provided you define value on a strategic level and align and manage all stakeholders, a corporate perspective on social value will enhance economic returns as well. This combination underlies the success of today's bio-based businesses. Which brings us to the third beneficiary of value, the shareholders. Shareholder value is the value that investors in your firm receive in return from their investment. This value is mostly expressed in monetary units, such as profit and return on investment. Due to the financial crisis of the past decade, shareholder value has become negatively associated with investors, putting short-term profits above all else and losing sight of customer value. This view on investors is however outdated. It is widely agreed that today's investors look especially for projects that offer a clear view on how longer-term customer value and social value is safeguarded. Without customer and social value, it is difficult to attract investors and deliver them a just return on shareholder value. Needless to say, without a solid shareholder value, most bio-based projects will not be born. The enforcing relationship between 1. the three types of value, 2. the innovative market-oriented capabilities, and three, the social responsibilities that are needed to deliver them are nicely captured in Kibbeling's propeller model of 2010. To offer you some practical guidance on defining your own value components, you might consider the following six steps. First, everything begins with you, the entrepreneur and your team. Define what your objectives are and why you are doing what you do. What is it you would like to achieve? Make sure your scope is not too broad, nor too narrow. A scope is too broad when it's highly unlikely that you will ever offer all the products and services that could fit into it. For example, supplying MP3 files to music lovers is too narrow, but bringing music to everybody's life would be too broad. If you're Spotify or Apple, 
the scope would be something like helping music lovers acquire and organize music. Two, develop your value equation or theory of change. You might use popular tools such as Austin Walder's business model canvas or Kaplan and Norton's strategy map as preparatory tools. You might find it helpful to summarize the critical input-output relationships in a simple overview such as this. But make sure you limit yourself to the most critical re relationships. You cannot measure everything. 3. Define how you will measure and test the relationships and begin collecting information. Make sure you use sources such as experts and potential customers. The experience of various practitioners illustrates that conversations with leading experts are a good way forward. These experts will help you obtain a better sense of market structures, important actors and the size of certain markets. These insights are especially useful when entering markets in which you have no previous experience. Trades and fairs are usually good places to contact such, such experts. Conversations with potential customers provide insights into their needs and their willingness to adopt and pay for your solution. Be careful to select the right customer and not to introduce you to the often overly positive estimates of enthusiastic potential partners. Make sure you enter those conversations with an open mind and learning approach. Otherwise, you risk only hearing what you like to hear. For example, questionnaires that are too structured increase the risk of missing hidden signals and clues regarding less obvious and untargeted customer needs. 4. Sharing and collective meaning making. Make sure you share your learnings with the relevant stakeholders and discuss the consequences for your project. By sharing, you will correct your findings for biases, provided you have an open attitude to learning, and you will create consensus among those people who are key for executing your plan. To ensure that key stakeholders are involved and that the discussion leads to meaningful action, you might prepare for this by undertaking a stakeholder analysis. 5. Make regular corrections and communicate. In today's turbulent and dynamic environments, it is difficult to predict the future. For projects with larger lead times, it is especially impossible to know what competitor action will be or how relevant and unique your offering will be by the time it is delivered. The Iridium case teaches us that it is important to take small steps, to correct your estimations at regular intervals and every time new information becomes available, and to prevent escalation of commitment, it is very important to define upfront a criteria for one stage to the next. 6. Once your product is out in the marketplace, use your value equation for regular reporting and communication. You may even develop your product further into a value dashboard. This is it for this lecture. We've done quite some work looking at why it is important to understand and assess the value of your bio-based project in the earliest phase possible. We've defined value and the customer, firm and social components of it, and we concluded by considering six process steps that can help you in your own value estimations. Thank you for your time, and if you would like to learn more about deep customer insights and market opportunities, we could meet again in the MOOC Creating Valuable Innovations.